Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, thank you for coming. We will get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to have George Porter here. Uh, George is um, uh, from UC San Diego. He uh, got his PhD back in uh, 2005, uh, 2008, sorry, uh, from, uh, from Berkeley. And uh, he's spent the majority of his time since then at UCSD. Um, you know George from his uh, data center work. He's been doing a bunch of work with a bunch of fabulous students at uh, UC San Diego. He's going to tell us about that. Uh, George also took over uh, pretty much all of the data center research from Amin Vadat when he uh, left and went to Google. And uh, George is also um, helping manage and run uh, the Center for Network Systems at UCSD. Awesome. Thank you. All right, thanks, thanks, Jared. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity to come and give you a talk today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't think I need to tell this audience this, but please uh, ask questions during my talk if you have any questions or comments. So. All right, so my name is George Porter. And I'm going to be talking today about um, building resource-efficient data-intensive applications. So it's incredible how much of our lives has moved online, from information gathering, entertainment, uh, collaborative tools, healthcare, medicine, government. Effectively, everything we do in some way has, has moved online. And each of these applications is fundamentally driven by data. The quality of your user experience using all of these sites depends on, in some way, the quantity of data that each of these applications can process over. And it's not just that um, these things are driven by data. Uh, you know, it's sort of like if you think of the way Amazon uses data to build, say, product recommendations. Uh, Spotify uses data to build custom radio stations. Uh, Bing uses data to build personalized search. Um, and it isn't just that they're data driven, but they're also data driven on a per user basis. So for example, if we look at the way Amazon works, you know, when you visit the main sort of landing page on Amazon.com, the page that gets generated is customized to you. And in fact, uh, each time you access this page, there's over 100 underlying applications that are doing things like collaborative filtering, uh, consulting with ad networks, your previous purchase histories, preferences, et cetera. And each of these applications uh, is driven by data. And so there's an enormous amount of data processing and I.O. that goes on ahead of time, behind the scenes, before you arrive at these pages, in order to generate all the data that's needed to consult during that request so that this uh, content can be customized to you. And so all of these different applications and data processing requirements have driven the need for very large data center uh, deployments. So in order to scale up to meet the needs of all of these different users, uh, companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and others have um, developed these large data centers, which are warehouse scale building, uh, buildings housing sort of tens to hundreds of thousands of servers, storage, uh, networking gear, cooling power, uh, et cetera. And the result of these data centers has been an incredible amount of scalability. And so, for example, you know, Google serves out 100 billion searches per month. Facebook has a billion active users. Uh, Amazon has actually is closer to about 200 million active users today. And this incredible scalability result has had to, um, you know, has been arrived at in an incredibly short amount of time. So, if you actually last month was the 25th anniversary of the web. And about 20 years ago, the first sort of mainstream web browser was released. And back then, really, everything was basically small scale. So Google's first data center fit on a folding card table. And supposedly, the, Facebook, uh, you know, the first Facebook uh, server was sort of run out of a, a dorm room type environment. And so those numbers that I just quoted to you, uh, you know, 100 billion searches a, a month and a billion active users, has had to been developed in about 15 years and 10 years, respectfully. And I think even at established organizations, as established companies, the, you're going to see similar scaling results for anything that's kind of user facing. And so these organizations have really had to be driven by a relentless focus on scalability. And so in order to close the gap between no users and effectively the internet connected world's population in order 10 years, everything that's been developed has had to focus on scalability. So the data centers that I described, the applications that run in those data centers, the infrastructure that underlie all of those applications, the storage infrastructure, all of that is really driven to be able to grow as fast as possible and effectively grow at any cost. And those costs are incredible. So I don't have to tell you that there's enormous capital expenses in terms of building each of these data centers. And so the way you can think of that, of course, is that 
every time you want to roll out a new application or every time you want to grow to a new set of users, you have to stamp out effectively one of these billion dollar buildings. But they're also incredibly expensive to operate as well with sort of industry estimates at tens of billions of kilowatts hours uh, uh, kind of industry wide. And yet underlying all of this impressive scalability results lies an enormous amount of inefficiency. So again, industry estimates about six to 12% of that power actually gets translated into productive work. And the question becomes sort of, why is that gap exists? Like why is all of their, this inefficiency in terms of these data intensive uh, applications? And one of the main sources of inefficiency really comes down to IO. It's really about input output. You can think of this in terms of IO bottlenecks between distributed applications and the underlying data that lives on the storage layer underneath them. Uh, and there's also enormous amounts of bottlenecks in between nodes, sort of in a distributed cluster, shuffling data between each other. And these bottlenecks result in servers that end up waiting for data. So this is referred to as like a pipeline bubble or a pipeline stall, wherein one node is waiting for another node to complete. And before it can make progress, it has to wait till that data arrives from that other node. And so this can cause these sort of cascading performance failures, wherein large scale systems end up spending a lot of time waiting on data. Um, and this can also kind of manifest in terms of requiring a much larger compute and storage footprint than you would otherwise need uh, if you just looked at the amount of processing needed to make the these applications work. And so what we really need to do is to focus on recapturing IO efficiency. And this boils down to kind of a very simple application of Amdahl's law, which is we want to, uh, if we look at data intensive applications where IO is really the bottleneck, we need to uh, eliminate any unnecessary IOs that we can. And for those IOs that are necessary, we want to make sure that they are as efficient as possible. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about this in effect in two different domains, uh, which I'll get to in a second. So stepping back for a second, if we kind of look at the last 25 years, we've really been focusing on this goal of scale and achieving systems that are able to scale. And as we kind of pivot and look towards the you know, future, it's important that we develop systems that are able to scale efficiently in order to deal with you know, growing user populations and growing data set sizes. And so the work that I'm going to describe falls into these two domains. The first is on IO efficient data processing. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, some work that my students, uh, myself and my colleagues have worked on in terms of uh, building very large scale efficient sorting systems uh, and using those to build large scale data processing systems. And the second domain is on the node to node, getting rid of node to node bottlenecks in the system. So focusing on IO efficient data intensive uh, networking. And we've been looking at data center interconnect designs that rely on circuit switching in addition to sort of more traditional packet switching models and combining those. And we've been able to show that uh, this approach will allow you to um, sort of cut uh, the cost of your network infrastructure by uh, 2.8x and the power by 6x. And I'll, I'll go into these in a little bit in a second. Yes. Uh, are there some numbers to show uh, that iOS have a big problem in energy efficiency? So, are there numbers? Are, is there a quantitative way to show that IO is important? Yeah, IO is, well, is let's say, the, the big problem, one of the big, big problems in energy efficiency. Because you can, you can imagine, for example, that you know, things go to sleep very rapidly, all this kind of thing. Yeah. That, yeah. Know, so, that's a great question. Um, there are. Uh, so, when we sort of, so I guess you could look at this in two different ways. And one of them, like you said, is to make systems uh, somehow power proportional so that the amount of power they draw matches the kind of resource utilization that they're at. And there's definitely work in that. And that's an important line of work to do. But it seems like, at least in today's systems, um, even if you, there's, things aren't very power, power proportional. So there's a lot of overhead, a lot of costs associated with keeping all the machines running. And so you're really better off trying to drive as much throughput through your system as you can and sort of max out all of your hardware. That that's a, a sort of a more efficient, I guess, point in the space. And I hope that in, the, in kind of describing this work, I'm going to go through some quantitative analysis of where some of these bottlenecks are. And I think I'll answer your question that there is, in fact, you can, you can actually see where, where those bottlenecks are. Great. OK. So um, I want to talk first about IO efficient data processing. And I want to define, I want to start kind of by kind of defining what I mean when I say data intensive. I've used that term a couple times already. And over the last 30, year, 30 years or so, the definition of what makes something data intensive has changed quite a bit. Um, so in sort of the mid 80s, it might be, let's say, 100 megabytes is a data intensive job. And today, it's maybe 100 uh, terabytes or even a petabyte. And so 
over this 30 year time span, there's been effectively a million fold increase in what we mean by data intensive. And so over that time period, the types of applications that have been used to solve these jobs has changed quite a bit. And so today, if you talk about data intensive computing, a lot of times what you mean is, for example, MapReduce. This is a, um, uh, what, uh, what is a, a representative example of a sort of data intensive framework for doing processing. And MapReduce is actually not a new idea. If you're a Lisp programmer, you've been using it for some time. But if you're not familiar with it, I'll really briefly describe it right now. So in a MapReduce program, uh, you're given as input a set of key value pairs. And you start by applying a user supplies map function to each of these pairs. Uh, you then group that, the results of that function application by key and you sort each group. And then finally, you apply a user supplied reduce function to each of these uh, groups. And so if we kind of zoom into what's going on in the implementation of this programming model, uh, we see that the application of the map function and the application of the reduce function, which I'm going to call map tasks and reduce tasks, uh, this is what's called embarrassingly parallel, meaning that we can execute these functions entirely node local without any network communication. And so what we're really left with in terms of building a, a MapReduce framework is exactly this group by and this sort operation. And in a lot of ways, this is really the hard part about building these large scale systems because it's almost exactly opposite of embarrassingly parallel. Generally speaking, data from each of these nodes has to be shuffled, conveyed, and delivered to each of these destinations. And the application of these functions really is bottleneck based on all of these IOs completing. And so managing and dealing with all of this IO is an enormous challenge. And we're not the first people to really identify that as a huge challenge. Um, actually, in the mid 80s, uh, the now late Jim Gray wanted to focus people's attention on the importance of the IO subsystem when building data processing systems. So looking beyond sort of, uh, you know, how many floating point operations per second and starting to look at a, a holistic view of the system where you see kind of IOs as a part of this. And so the way that he did this was actually really cool. So he proposed a contest, a sorting contest, in which the idea was to see who could sort 100 megabytes of data the fastest. And this was great for two reasons. One of them is that you all, we all learn about sorting sort of freshman year uh, of college. And so everyone involved in these industry and academic uh, efforts kind of had a good sense of what it meant to sort data. But the second reason this was really cool is that across a variety of different data processing applications, we now have some representative benchmark or stand in for what the IO performance is, what the resource efficiency of these applications is. So we can kind of do an apples to apples comparison. So obviously, things have changed quite a bit since the 80s. And so by the late 90s, this had grown to a terabyte uh, terasort record or contest, uh, which was won by the Berkeley Now Project. And then when we started our project uh, in 2009, the idea was to sort 100 terabytes of data. And so uh, this was held by the Hadoop uh, open source MapReduce project that was being hosted at Yahoo. Great. So now we've got this really great benchmark of IO efficiency. And I was talking about how systems in practice are not efficient. And so now that we've got this benchmark, let's see how deployed systems do in practice. Yeah. Uh, so, in, so the thing about the shuffle being the bottleneck is true with the sort, but aren't there many other jobs where you know, the map thing kind of filters a big part of the data out such that that is the bottleneck? Yeah, so, so that's a great question too. Um, the kind of selectivity of that map operation, um, it can vary quite a bit. Obviously, if you're searching for or data in a very large data set and you're looking for kind of a needle in a haystack, the output of that map will be um, a small set, data set size. Uh, I guess the thing about sort is that the selectivity of that is one to one, so every output record. And so it's kind of a worst case from the point of view of IO performance. And so for a lot of jobs that are low CPU to data item ratio, it looks a lot like sort. And so that's why we've been kind of focusing on it is because oftentimes what you're doing is comparing items, uh, ranking items, things like that, that don't require a lot of CPU per item. But you do end up having to convey all this information somewhere else. Do you have like, some quantification for which, how much is one to one versus, say, one to one? So that's a good point, too. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, so there are, you can find evidence of this in various published pieces of work. Um, and it varies depending on the organization. And I think the audience in this room would have a much better sense of what exactly that CDF looks like than I would. So I'd love to chat with you about it to the extent you can talk about it. Okay, so great. Now we've got this benchmark of what we mean by resource efficiency, and let's see how well deployed systems do in practice. So in 2010, these two researchers from HP Labs looked at the results of that gray sort contest, and they looked at all the winners, and the way they analyzed that data was as follows. 
what they did was they took the delivered performance of each of those sorting systems and they compared it to the inherent capabilities of the underlying hardware platform and they, they looked at that difference. And the results were surprising and incredibly discouraging. So on average, 94% of disk I.O. was idle and about a third of CPU capacity was idle. And this is among the winners. So, you know, this is, this is definitely not good. And if we kind of look um, more specifically at this 2009 uh, Yahoo result, they were able to sort 100 terabytes of data with 3,452 nodes in about three hours, which is quite impressive. But if you actually kind of look at what each node is contributing to that overall result, what you see is that each of the disks in the system is in some sense running at approximately 1% efficiency. And so we're in the situation where we're able to achieve these um, very impressive results via scalability, uh, but we're running at sort of low efficiency. And remember, these, uh, these data centers are incredibly expensive to build and operate. And so the goal that we kind of like to set out is to be able to achieve the same data set size result in the same amount of time, but with effectively two orders of magnitude fewer resources. Yeah, Ritul. This measure seems a little bit strange to me in the sense like, uh, unless you're building your hardware, Specific to the workload, you, it seems like you always have some resource that is not a bottleneck and hence underutilized. So that's so, so in, in that sense, like what what is this measure really showing us? Yeah. So it's it's in some what we'd like to get is a fully perfectly balanced system, right? Where all of our resources are balanced with each other, so that no one resource is. Um, or I should say, if we were to reduce the amount of any one resource, the entire system should slow down. That's, a, that's some goal that's implicit in the work that I'm describing. Now, as you point out, there's a lot of heterogeneous jobs. And so in one set of workloads or one set of jobs, you may end up with one resource as the bottleneck. And in some other particular type of job, you might end up with a different resource as the bottleneck. I do think, though, that focusing on storage as the bottleneck is the tack that we've taken because a lot of systems really are storage I.O. limited. And so, um, you know, using this as a way to start solving some of the systems problems of getting the storage I.O. up is, is one of the goals that we've had. And I think that can be good. When you say storage I.O. limited, yeah. you mean that they are the major source of inefficiency in the sense that they're just idling. Is that, is that what you mean by limited? They're either, so yeah, either they're idling or they're fully being utilized and there's not enough disks to actually keep the workload, to keep all the CPUs busy. Or third, they're fully being utilized, but there are extra IOs being issued that aren't necessary. That's another way you can look at it. So I hope that in some way addresses your question. Yeah. Another metric could be that essentially instead of arguing you know, arguing about say storage or CPU, you essentially say you pick say a standard server skew, right? So for your essentially you know, hundred terabytes per X skews. Um, would you still have similar problems? Because then essentially you're essentially saying, well, I don't really care if Desk is 1% or 100%, but as long as I optimize for that metric under some standard skew, then essentially it's apples for apples. So I think what you're saying is sort of that you've you sort of settled in a certain sense on a binding of compute, memory, network, and storage, and then you're sort of replicating this unit to the data set size that you need. And I think that's the way people build real systems, right? You sort of provision a server model and you kind of scale that out, and that's the cluster that you build. And what I would say is that inherent in making that, that binding of compute, storage, networking, and um, memory, you're, you already have an idea of what that balance is between CPU and I.O., either I.O. to the network or I.O. to the storage. So to a certain extent, you've already kind of have this sense that there's some ratio, and that's, what you're, that's why you build a, a platform in a certain way. And so when we started this work, and I, don't have, I didn't describe it in the, the slides here, but we knew that the types of jobs we were going to be working on were low CPU to I.O. And so we wanted uh, to use servers that has many disks po as possible in them. And so at the time, we were able to get machines that had 16 disks. But if we had 25 disks, that would have been even better. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, just to follow on Radul's question, yeah. you said that um, your goal is to build a system so that resources utilization is essentially balanced across all resources. Mm -hmm. so, you know, any one resource you reduce impacts the system performance. It's not clear that that's a good goal, right? Because resources don't cost equal uh, amount of money. So suppose disk I.O. was much cheaper than CPU. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be happy to waste a large amount of disk I.O. as long as yeah. my CPU utilization. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. So, you know, for example, PennySort was essentially geared towards doing something like that. Yeah. Or measuring. So why not use that as a goal? I mean, 
most amount of data at the least possible price. We actually get to that. So I think, um, I think I'm going to revisit this because one of the things we were focused on was per node efficiency. And um, this sort contest, uh, you mentioned penny sort, there's also like a jewel sort contest that we entered as well. And I guess what we found is that the reason that we've been focused so much on, on disk IO is that otherwise you end up with all of the CPU and memory that's sort of waiting on basically on disks. And you need a lot of disk whenever you have data intensive applications just because of the capacity issue. And, and so what we found was that by kind of driving up the efficiency of that resource, we end up getting energy efficiency. And I'll describe that in just a minute. Yeah. So maybe it'll be clear if you uh, define efficiency, right? Work done per dollar, work done per watt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, again, I, when I talk about the evaluation, I'll mention this a little bit. This sorting contest is not just a absolute performance contest. There are these different categories. And it gets to this issue that, so there is a work done per watt, and there's work done per dollar or for penny, and then there's simply who can do work the fastest. And those aren't always, they don't always lead you to the same system design. And so a, a case in point of this that's kind of interesting is that for this eco sort, for this jewel sort contest, there's kind of like two solutions to this equation. And we've got one of the solutions and Dave Anderson's group at CMU has the other solution. And so we've been focusing on if we can build a system that can just handle raw throughput, what we end up with is even though our servers are 300 watts each and we've got 10 gig networking and stuff, you know, you end up with a very highly efficient system. On the other hand, you can focus on atoms and things like that and get a, a different solution. It just depends on, on your, your assumptions, absolutely. So I, I'll expose that in just a second. And we've been talking a little bit about this balance issue and, and I just want to mention that right now, which is that to a certain extent, this project is, is in the context of a larger set of work on looking at trying to come up with the right balance of these different resources in terms of addressing different types of jobs. And one aspect of balance has to do with the data itself. So in an ideal world, we'd like to divide our cluster up into these groups, and we would like to distribute our data in a very uniform way across each of these nodes. And then we've got a variety of processing elements on each node, which I'm going to represent with these funnels, that represent, in some sense, a CPU or disk type um, resource. And if we're able to kind of very uniformly distribute all this data and all these resources, then all of the data can be processed uniformly. And we don't end up with a lot of pipeline stalls because data gets generated as it's needed. And that's a very efficient way to design systems. Of course, the real world is not as kind to us as we would like it to be. And data can be incredibly non-uniform. So if you look at, for example, census data, you know, Seattle is going to have a lot more entries in it than Driftwood, Texas, or something like that. And so these, um, Im this imbalance can end up causing some of the nodes to become bottlenecks, which causes this cascading ripple effect. But resources are also highly heterogeneous as well. So some disks are faster than others. But even if you bought all exactly identical disks, all with the same part numbers, you're going to end up seeing this very wide variance in delivered performance based on um, just the fact that you have so many of these resources put into a, into a single cluster. And one of the things is that this imbalance, one of the effects of this imbalance is you end up with not just an efficient I.O., but actually wasted I.O.s. So the thing that's interesting about sorting is that any external, there's this well-known lower bound, which is that any external sorting algorithm requires that you read and write each data item at least twice in the worst case. And what we say is that any system that actually meets that lower bound has this two I.O. property. And that's one of the goals that we set for ourselves when we started this work. Now, that imbalance that I just showed on the previous slide can result in extra reads and writes that aren't necessary. And this is due to what's called intermediate data materialization, meaning that you don't have enough memory to, for example, keep your entire working set in DRAM, and so you end up issuing reads and writes to process that data iteratively. And that's what we mentioned before about you can have your disks running at full, at 100% sort of uh, load, even though you end up with extra IOs that are cutting that effective load down to something like 1%. So it's not that in that Yahoo cluster the disks were only being operated at 1% of the time, it's just that 1% of their performance got delivered into the aggregate performance of the system. And just like the data can cause imbalance, the imbalance disks can lead to this exact same problem for the reason I just mentioned. Okay, So we'd like to restore balance. Um, and we do that in two ways, statically, before the job begins, and then at runtime. So we're going to borrow techniques from the database community to sample our data to get a sense of where these partition boundaries are going to be. So this is research. This is uh, things that databases do all the time. And that's how we figure out what these partition boundaries are. But the key thing is, is that at runtime, 
we still need to um, Im impose balance because even if our data has been statically allocated correctly to these partitions, because the on-disk layout of the data can have um, non-uniformity in it, we have to handle that at runtime. And that's what I'm going to describe in this part of the talk right now. Okay, so we built a, a two I/O sorting system called Triton Sort that we presented in uh, NSDI 2011, and it is structured as follows. So instead of many fine-grained tasks processing the data in a divide and conquer approach, we have two phases of operation. So in the first phase, the distribution phase, we divide our data up into these partitions based on that on those samples, uh, and then we read all of our data in in parallel, and we assign each data item to one of these partitions. And in phase one, we send it over to the network to the node it belongs to, and we store it in one of these on-disk partitions. So at the end of phase one, all the data is on the right node, and it's in the right partition, but each of these partitions is unsorted. And so in phase two, in parallel across the cluster, we read in each of these partitions, uh, sort it in memory, and write it back out again. And we've also sized our partitions so that we can ensure that each of these are going to fit into memory. So to see that in, in action, uh, we start by reading a buffer of data off our input disk. Uh, we have a process that's assigning it to these different partitions and copying it into in-memory buffers designed for the different destination nodes. And then when these um, buffers get full, we have some code that sends them over the network to the node they belong to. Then on the receiving side, as data arrives, we append it to a variety of these on-disk partitions. And just to give you a sense of the, the numbers that involved here, we've got eight output disks on our machine, and each disk has about three or 400 of these partitions on it. You can think of it as three or 400 on-disk files that store the data. In phase two, we're going to read uh, one of these unsorted uh, partitions into memory, sort it, and write it out. So the bulk of that pipeline, is the details are in our paper, and it's actually pretty straightforward to implement. And the real complexity of that system is exactly this partition appending module, because um, we have to ensure that we're writing out data to these disks in large enough batches that the disks deliver good performance. And so I'll just describe very briefly how we do that now. So, this module is given as input on the left, a buffer of these key value pairs. And on the right, we've got a set of disks. Uh, each of them is holding a couple hundred of these partitions. And there's a thread before each one of these is ready to write out data to the disk. So the first thing we did was we implemented the kind of most straightforward way of doing this, which is to sort of scan through this buffer of key value pairs and rely on uh, the operating system to deliver and manage the I.O. for us. So we just issued writes or scatter gather writes or uh, sort of fancier writes. And the result was that the system performed, we had low performance. And the reason for that was really just due to the fact that there wasn't enough buffering handled automatically by the OS to ensure that the writes getting delivered to these disks were sufficiently large to run at near their sequential speed. So what we did was we sort of scrounged up as much of the memory as we possibly could, about 80% of the memory on each node, which was 20 gigabytes. And we managed all the buffering ourselves. So we divided this memory up across all of our different partitions. We copy data into these partitions, and when they get full, we write them out to disk. But I mentioned that there's this non-uniformity of the input data. And so what ends up happening is these partitions are either really hot or very cold. And so taken as a whole, our memory was not particularly well utilized. And so the result of that meant that our writes were not particularly very large. So what we ended up doing was building a load balancer that ran at runtime in front of our disk. And it works as follows. We took that same 20 gigabytes of memory, and now we divided it up into 2 million little 10 kilobyte uh, buffers that we stick in a memory pool. And so as data starts arriving from the network, we basically are going to copy it into these little buffers and stick it into a data structure here. And the way this data structure is um, organized is that we have a row for each of our 2,500 or so partitions. And each of these rows, which corresponds to one partition, what we're going to do is we you know, grab a buffer, put our data in there, and then we add it to a list or a chain of these buffers per partition. And um, the nice thing about this data structure is that as partitions popularity varies during a run, even on short time scales, we can extend some of these chains to become longer, and then some of the less popular uh, partitions have shorter chains, but none of our memory is actually being dedicated that isn't actively being used. In parallel with this, there is a process that's constantly scanning this data structure, and it's looking for the longest length chain which represents, at that instant in time, the largest write that we could issue to the disk at a given time. So what we do is once we find this, we pull it out of this table, we send it off to this thread, which is going to write it off to the appropriate on-disk partition. And then it's going to take all of these buffers, add them back into the pool, and this is going to be the back pressure mechanism that we use to um, push back pressure back to the producing side of this pipeline. Now, 
This handles the uh, non-uniformity in the actual input data, but I mentioned resources can be non-uniform as well. And so imagine that we have a couple disks that are slower than other disks. The way this same uh, data structure actually handles the problem without requiring any modifications. So this process is constantly scanning for these chains is only actually looking for the subset of chains that could be issued at that given time. And so what that means is that if you have a slower disk, the chains behind it are going to build up and you're going to end up issuing larger writes to them, which is going to a little bit help mitigate this non-uniformity in some way. Okay, so we've looked a little bit about how we handle I.O. Uh, in Triton sort, and I want to talk about our evaluation. So when we began the project, uh, in terms of the 100 terabyte gray sort, the Hadoop MapReduce project had uh, been able to sort data at 0.578 terabytes per minute. Uh, and then with Triton sort, in 2010, 11, and 12, uh, we were able to sort at 0.725 terabytes a minute uh, using a cluster of 52 nodes. And it was just based on these issues that I just talked about. Now, as is the case in any particular type of contest, uh, eventually your record is, is taken back again. And at least in terms of 100 terabyte uh, gray sort, Hadoop um, was able to run at 1.42 terabytes per minute on 2,200 nodes in 2013 with a much more recent version of Hadoop. There's some other categories I didn't describe here, like the Indie benchmark, which uh, you guys took back from us. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we're, we're working, I guess, to see if we can uh, to, to retake that. But I mentioned that it's not just raw performance that we were really interested in. The point of this project was to focus on resource efficiency. And the community uh, identified that as a really important metric as well. And so in 2010, uh, they added a dual sort category, which exactly captures this eco-efficiency. And we were able to capture that in 2011 and 12, but also maintain it in 2013. And the reason for that is because even though we were beat out in terms of absolute performance, if you just look at the quotient of the amount of work we did times the number of nodes, we're able to push about two orders of magnitude more throughput for, through each of our servers. And so that's why we were able to keep that kind of performance. Now, I, I want to briefly mention um, fault tolerance at this point, because any system you build has to be fault tolerant. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go into the details here, but what I would say is that the fault tolerance approach that you adapt really depends on the failure assumptions that you have in the system. So if failures are really common, you want a pessimistic approach to fault tolerance. And if failures are rare, you want an, an optimistic approach. The, dis the Triton sort pipeline I described required, uh, relies on very aggressive pipelining. So you notice we're not materializing data at all, whereas something like Hadoop requires um, materializing intermediate data in the common case. And so what I would say is that, you know, we looked at some published results, for example, from Google in 2010, and kind of what you see is that at a sort of 10,000 node cluster size, you're seeing failures like every two minutes or something like that. And so it's really important that you need to, you actually want tasks to be able to, or you want jobs to be able to survive individual faults. And so materializing job state is probably a really good idea. Um, if you, we actually talked to the people at Cloudera, and the average Hadoop cluster sizes mm -hmm. are order of something like 30 to 200 nodes. And even adding uh, an order of magnitude to these number of nodes, you end up with failure rates in the sort of double digit hours, hundreds of hours time frame. And so here, what we're going to argue is that it's actually OK to do job level fault tolerance, where you re-execute jobs on failure, as long as the performance improvement you get by running without fault tolerance is high enough to, to uh, overcome the occasional job re-execution. So this is, there's no hard and fast rule here, and I think there's, there's sort of a dividing line depending on exactly what your failure model is, but um, this is something that we've been looking at. And the future work that we've been, uh, actually Alex Rasmussen, which is the uh, lead student on the uh, Triton Sword project, is we've been looking at taking trace data and selectively re-executing parts of the pipeline that have failed or that parts of the pipeline that depend on a failure to uh, mitigate the cost of re-executing this work. Maybe we can talk about that offline. OK, so yeah. How much of your gains in terms of, I think, efficiency coming from resource balancing versus fault tolerance, like compared to competitors? Well, it, so if we look at Hadoop, for example, there is one extra materialization that happens after the map task, uh, which we get rid of. But actually, there are three different places in the pipeline where materialization happens. And two of those places are actually just due to data skew. So um, what I would say is that effectively, a third of the IO we get rid of is due to fault tolerance. And two thirds is due to resource imbalance and uh, data, set, data set imbalance. Yeah. So why does it do just do this? I mean, are there, are there practical reasons why they don't do it? Because they're 
developers are jerks. <laughs> no, 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 no. I guess what I'm wondering yeah. is, so you show like all these very yeah. nice results, yeah. and so you would think the Hadoop guys just say we're just going to nom nom that put it in there, and we're going to beat all your records. No, yeah, the Hadoop people are great. I, we're, so I have a I have a patch that's been in there since 2008 <laughs> for this, and uh, it's part of the problem is that. Um, well, it's actually interesting. In a sense, they are doing this. So there has been a huge move to these in-memory, completely in-memory data processing sort of applications. And in these cases, you're getting rid of effectively all the data materialization at the expense of more cost. But, um, uh, you know, I think that, so that's kind of one extreme, sort of getting rid of all of the data materialization. Um, I think, though, that if you look at actually where Hadoop's going with projects like Tez, which is like this data flow thing, you're, you're seeing that they're giving users much more control over what materializations they do. So right now, you kind of fit into the MapReduce model. But if you're doing something like an iterative job, there is now a lot of support for being able to control exactly when those materializations happen. So I think, you know, I think, I think that's happening. Yeah, but Peter. just to follow up on this, uh, you, you, you take your own SKU that you built. Yeah. You're on one job at a time, mm -hmm. right? And so you really optimize the heck out of this. Yeah. But if you now have a different cluster with many jobs of different sizes, maybe not all our sort, yeah. how would, could this directly be applied? Would you lose some efficiency? We have to tweak things to make it really work? Yeah, so this is, this is great because at a very high level, this first part of the talk, we are giving up statistical multiplexing, and what we're doing is we're focusing on individual task efficiency. So rather than sort of taking lots of different tasks that have heterogeneous requirements, putting them on the system at a time, and then co-scheduling them, we are dedicating resources without using stat mugs. And one thing that I would say is that if you've got a petabyte cluster and you have a bunch of 10 terabyte jobs, you have a lot of opportunities for doing stat mugs. But if you're resource constrained, let's say you're a research group, let's say you're a startup, you're a working in biology or something like that, you may want to solve petabyte scale jobs, but you only have the resources to run petabyte scale clusters. And so the question of is StatMux better than not StatMux is an interesting question when you're not resource constrained. But if you are resource constrained, you can't even ask that question. And so I think that it's good to focus on things like job and cluster scheduling, obviously, if you are doing stat mugs. But it doesn't hurt to also look at can you actually s kind of pull in as much efficiency as you can out of individual tasks when you don't have the opportunity to do stat mugs. But, but yeah. it's not clear how directly this would apply yeah. to these. Yeah, I think. I'm if, sure you can get better. Yeah, so just to answer this real quick, um, if you assume that the if you assume that the compute and the storage are co-located with each other, you don't have a ton of choice in that matter. But if you separate them, for example, like with the Blizzard work uh, from NSDI last week, where you actually get to sort of logically separate storage and compute, you could imagine dedicating a very tightly connected set of machines to storage, getting full bandwidth of that storage. And then when that job's done, now maybe an order of magnitude more computers can access that same amount of storage. So you get light binding on that. I guess it depends. So I don't want to run too long, so I'm going to move a little bit forward. Um, Sorting isn't all we care about. We obviously care about data processing. So we built this system called Themis. And um, uh, Themis, I'm sorry, yeah. So we implemented all of these different applications here. And um, what I want to show, I don't have time to go into the details, but what you see on this graph is the performance of our MapReduce system, where the y-axis is throughput in terms of megabytes per second per disk in each of our phases. The x-axis is all the different jobs that we've done uh, and different levels of SKU. And what you see is for the vast majority of these jobs, we've pushed our storage performance similar to our record setting sort performance. Now, I said almost all, there is this uh, Cloudburst example where in the first phase of Cloudburst, it is IO bound. And so we see that, that uh, performance improvement. But the second phase isn't IO bound, which kind of exposes this point we talked about uh, uh, at the beginning of the talk, which is that um, when you get rid of one bottleneck, you can oftentimes push it somewhere else. And a place that you typically push it is the network. Now, for us, this wasn't a huge problem because Cisco donated one of these big data center switches to our group, and we only had 52 nodes, and we had enough ports to give full bisection bandwidth. But if you've got, you know, 152,000 nodes, that's not such an easy problem. And so that kind of leads to the second part of my talk, which is focusing on the data center interconnect. So just like, you know, applications have changed, the network has changed quite a bit as well, and we've seen this enormous uh, growth in terms of data rates.
And so the types of networks that people have built to address this growth in performance has changed quite a bit. My first exposure to these kind of networks was um, in the 1994 when I worked at this ISP in, in Houston. And the way that a lot of networks were built then and even today is as these tree type structures. And uh, you've got nodes along the bottom and then you have layers of switching getting increasingly powerful as you move towards the root. And if you imagine, let's say, a 100,000 node data center at 10 gigabits a second, that's a petabit of aggregate bandwidth demands. Now, the real problem is, is that you simply can't, from a technology point of view, buy core switches that are fast enough to actually handle all of this bandwidth. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so researchers have actually looked back to the 1940s and taken ideas from uh, Bell Labs kind of in the 40s and 50s and adapted them for data center designs. And so this is what's called a folded clow multi-rooted tree. And it's some version of this is deployed in many types of data centers. And this was proposed in uh, SICOM 2008. And the key thing here is that we don't have these really powerful switches in the middle of the network. Instead, if we have 10 gigabit a second servers, all of the switches in our network are 10 gigabits a second. And we get all of that bandwidth by relying on multipathing to deliver an aggregate amount of bandwidth. And so if you have enough links in the network, you can load balance and distribute traffic appropriately to get a high amount of aggregate bandwidth. And what we've done is traded off impossible to buy switches with a very challenging but solvable with money problem of adding lots of links into this network. And so a 64,000 node data center has about 200,000 links in it. And these links are incredibly expensive to kind of deal with them, installing them and managing them. They're also very expensive in terms of cost. And as we move from 10 to 40 to 100 gigabits a second of ethernet, they're gonna get disproportionately more expensive. And the real reason for that is that we can't rely on the copper cables that we know and love, and we have to move to fiber optics. Uh, and the reason for that is because of a property of copper cables called the uh, copper skin effect, which roughly speaking says that the faster the data rate of a cable, the shorter it has to be. So at a gigabit, you can buy spools of hundreds of meters worth of ethernet. The second you go to 10 gigabits, you're down to order 10 meters. And at 100 gigabits, you're talking about a couple meters in length. And remember, these are warehouse scale buildings, and so we have to overcome this length limitation in some way. And so the way people do that is to rely on optics, which don't have this copper skin effect. Um, and so you can send very high bandwidth, uh, you can create very high bandwidth links at very long lengths this way. Now the problem with optics is that you have to have some way to convert between the electrical signals that the switch understands and the optical signals uh, inside the fiber, and so you need a transceiver at either end of this cable that has a laser and a, a photoreceiver in it, which is used to make this conversion. And these transceivers are sort of ballpark $100, maybe 10 watts at 100 gigabits a second. And I know that several of you would have much better precise information about the pricing. This is sort of based on external information and papers and stuff like that. But the point is, is that they're not trivial in terms of cost. And you need two of these for each of these, say, 200,000 cables. So it adds up to a lot of money and a lot of power. To look at the implications of that, if we imagine a 100 gigabit a second uh, multi-rooted tree here, and we look at the path from a given source to a given destination, what we see is that packets transiting this path are constantly being converted to and from optics um, each, at each of these switch hops, at each layer of switching from the leaf up to the core, and then from the core back to the leaf. And so the implication of this is that for every device attached to the network, there's roughly speaking four to eight of these transceivers in the network kind of conveying the traffic for that device. And so at 100,000 nodes, that's like a megawatt of power and tens of millions of dollars or more. And if we step back from that for a second, I think it's worthwhile asking, why are we doing all of this packet switching? Why are we doing that? And what I would say is that these folded clo networks, the service model they actually provide is that they allow you to make a different and a unique forwarding decision for each packet that you send in the network. But that service model is I'm going to argue, too strong for many data centers. And as a result, there's a gap between the service model we're providing and the service model we could potentially survive, uh, provide. And this gap is how we're going to get resource efficiency. And to say what I mean in more specificity, there's a lot of locality in data centers. And actually, um, Microsoft has been great about publishing actual results uh, from your networks. And this is a picture that's reproduced from uh, one of these papers. And it's a little bit dated at the moment, but it does show kind of the the rack to rack traffic at an instant in time. And although the details change over time, what you can see is that a bulk of the traffic is going to a relatively small number of output ports. So there's a certain amount of spatial locality in these systems. 
But if we kind of look bottom up as well, we see that there's a lot of temporal locality as well. And so my student, Rishi Kapoor, published a paper in Conex last year where he looked at a 10 gigabit server uh, and he deployed a variety of kind of representative applications on top of it. And he measured the packets leaving that server at microsecond timescales. And what he saw was that because of all the batching that happens in applications, in system calls, uh, in the operating system kernel, in the NIC hardware, all of that sort of buffering and batching ends up translating into tens to hundreds of, pack of packets that are correlated in nature. So you tend to see when servers send large amounts of data from one place to another, they tend to do it in these kind of correlated bursts. And so the key idea behind this second part of the work is to use this temporal and spatial locality to build cost-effective networks by adopting circuit switching in addition to packet switching. So if you're not familiar with uh, circuit switching, I'll give you a very brief example. This shows a one input port, two output port circuit switch. And you could think of this as just an empty box that has some mirrors inside of it. And light enters the input port, it reflects off these mirrors and it leaves an output port. And if you wanna make a circuit switching decision, there are tiny motors underneath these mirrors that can move them, and this changes the angle of reflection and causes the light to leave out of a different port. Now, this is great because you don't need any transceivers. We're not doing this conversion. Uh, and it supports effectively unlimited bandwidth, meaning that as we go from 10 to 40 to 100 gigabits a second, this technology doesn't have to be changed. But circuit switching is an incredibly different service model than packet switching. And so this isn't just a drop-in replacement for your packet switches. You really have to kind of rethink the entire network stack. Um, and to give you kind of an example of that, I'm gonna talk about one aspect of the service model that has changed, which is called the reconfiguration delay. So the reconfiguration delay delta is the amount of time it takes to change the input to output mapping of that circuit switch. Um, and it's roughly speaking the time to move those little mirrors. And this determines how much locality you need for these circuit switches to be applicable in your network. If delta is really large, it means that it's incredibly expensive to change this circuit mapping. There's a very high overhead. And so you only ever really wanna support very large, highly stable, long-lived connections that in the networking world we call elephant flows. Now on the other hand, if delta is really small, you can very rapidly uh, reassign circuits on short time scales. And so you can support very highly bursty, unpredictable traffic called mice flows. Now I wanna point out, Delta is not fundamental. It's a technology dependent parameter. It depends on how you build these mirrors and, and some other aspects of the technology. But it is a very important parameter that determines this mixture of circuits to packets, yeah. So this delta, uh, did you also account for the delay for narrowing the traffic? Before you, you gotta narrow something and make the decision to switch or change, right? Yes. That narrowing time is, is, can be much longer than this. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is great. So this is talking about the actual data plane. Now you're talking about a control plane issue about how do you figure out what signals to send. We, I'll describe that in a minute, but we started by an observe, analyze, act approach. That became too slow, and so we ended up with the proactive approach that I'll describe in the talk. So yeah, we, this is an exact problem we dealt with. Yeah. Okay, so we have the sense that a majority of the traffic has locality, but not all of it. And so the way you can think about that pictorially is as follows. Imagine that we have, um, in, an, in a network with n connected devices, there's n squared possible connections. So we could rank order all of those n squared connections by the amount of traffic per connection. And because there's locality, the picture looks roughly speaking like this, where a bulk of the traffic is in a relatively small number of these connections. And so this leads to what we're saying is a hybrid design where we're gonna rely on both circuit switching and packet switching. So what we like to do is take the head of this distribution and send it over these circuit switches. And then this relatively long tail that has a lot of different connections but not a lot of bandwidth, we're gonna send over a less expensive, lower speed packet switch network. And it's exactly this delta value that determines this mixture of packets and circuits. Okay, so we, I told you delta is technology dependent and when we started the project, we had to get some sense of what that value was. So we obtained an optical circuit switch uh, that was developed in the late 90s for the telecom industry and we characterized it in our lab. And what we found was that the delta value was about 30 milliseconds. And what this means is that you need to keep circuits up for hundreds of milliseconds to seconds or longer to amortize that overhead. And so it's really only stable for very, it's only appropriate for very highly stable long-lived traffic. And the place you see long-lived traffic in the network is generally speaking at the core, we have a lot of aggregation. And so this led to the development of the Helios project, which was presented in SIGCOM 2010. And I showed you that multi-rooted tree before Imagine we're just focusing on the core switching layer only, 
And we're going to get rid of most of the packet switches in that switching layer, and we're going to replace them with a smaller number of these circuit switches. And then let's abstract the rest of the network away into these things we call pods, which are roughly speaking about a thousand servers or so. So the servers, the links, the switches, these are in these pods. And the idea behind the Helios project was to um, support this type of an environment. And so what we do is we start by sending traffic over our packet switches, and then there's a process that's looking for these elephant flows, and whenever it finds one of these elephant flows, it's going to add f updated flow rules down here to move it over to the circuit switch. So this is what you were talking about, about the time it takes to do that. Because we've got 30 milliseconds, that's like all the time in the world. So it's not a particularly big deal. And so we end up, uh, and there's details in the paper about exactly how we do that, but finding those elephant flows, moving them over that, over to here, we can, we can achieve all of that in this kind of tens of milliseconds time bound. Yeah. I feel like there's a, something of a tension between the two halves of your talk, which is that the, the, the first half of the talk is about efficiency, which by definition would try to use all links equally. Yeah. And it seems like it's exactly the opposite of what you want in order to be able to take flows that are elephants to similar certain switches. Yeah, yeah. So there's a commonality, which is that this is also getting rid of stat mux, if you want to think of it that way. But to get to your specific point, I think that um, you know, one of the main things here is that what we're doing here is we're, in a sense, trying to build a network that matches the average case utilization, even though that average case is rapidly changing, and the set of nodes that need high bandwidth is also rapidly changing. Today, your really only option is to effectively provision for the worst case. Um, and so, you know, in this, in this way, we're able to, as applications, as their communication patterns change, we're able to migrate things. But even in the Triton Sword case, if you think about the two phases, in phase one, we were fully utilizing the network. But in phase two, we actually had no network at all. This model would allow us to take that resource away and move it to another instance that does need the network. So if we were to overlap phase ones and twos in two different clusters, we could actually share the network between the two. So, yeah. All right, so uh, the result of the Helios project was that we were able to get rid of one of these transceivers in the core, um, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it actually represents a very large cost, complexity, and power savings. Because when we looked at this original network, we were looking at 10 gigabit networks. And so all of these pods, we could entirely interconnect them internally with electrical cabling. You only really needed optics for these core switch layers. And that's where all the transceivers were. But as we want to start moving to 100 gigabits a second, we're not going to be able to make that assumption anymore because we're going to have to start putting optics inside of these pods just because of the link limitation. So we need to start pushing circuit switching closer to the host into these pods. And that led us to um, our second project, which is called Mordia. Uh, and I want to say that the thing is, is that if we were able to aggregate over, over 1,000 servers with this 3D MEMS technology that was relatively slow, if we want to put circuit switching down to the host, we need a technology that's roughly speaking 1,000 times faster. And so we identified such a technology, which is a different kind of circuit switch device called binary MEMS. It's a little bit different. Uh, and what I will say is that the advantage of this binary MEMS technology is it's very fast. It's about two microseconds, so it's three orders of magnitude faster. But the downside about it is that it's not scalable. You can only buy switches that are maybe four or eight ports in size. Yeah. Last slide, I think. Are you making a strong assumption about the predictability? Because in two slides earlier, you essentially said that if there's a bursty pattern, right? So if yeah. I translate it here, you could keep, just keep ping ponging because you saw a burst, you essentially mislabeled a mice as an elephant. Yeah. You're getting a circuit to it, but now the circuit is idle. Yeah. You have to go back. So yeah. So implicit in this particular design is the idea that what we need, because delta is so high, we're only going to consider traffic for this that's stable for over a second. So these little bursts, too fast, because it's 30 milliseconds just to assign a circuit. And so for this, the only kind of traffic that we can actually support with this is traffic that's going to be stable for order a second or longer. Now with this technology, because we can reconfigure it in two microseconds, we actually only need traffic that's stable for about 100 microseconds to assign a circuit to here. And so that's one of the major issues here is that what we mean by circuit traffic or locality traffic depends on the delta value. And so now we can actually support the burst of a given server using circuits. But in getting to this point, we can't do things like measure, assign flow rules, et cetera, because we only have a couple microseconds to do that. So we have to be proactive, and that's what this project deals with. Yeah. Uh, 
for active, I suppose you've got to read all the counters of the flows at a very, uh, like a few microseconds. That's not, that's going to impose a lot of overhead on the switch itself. Ah, so we don't read, so instead of estimating traffic based on looking at packet counters and switches, what we actually do is we measure demand by looking at hosts. So we actually look at the hosts, what the buffer, the send buffers in the hosts are to see what their demand is going to be in the future. And we can... You yeah. still need to collect the statistic from the host, and that could also take longer. And uh, it doesn't... It, so it takes order microseconds, tens of microseconds, let's say, to have the host send this data out. And I don't have time to get to it in the talk, and I actually don't have slides to this, but it turns out that in this Mordia design, you can think of a pair of tours, I mean, two tours connected to each other. So they only actually have to exchange information on a pairwise basis. We don't have to collect this globally, do a decision, and send it back out again. Maybe we can talk about that sure. offline. So, yeah. so I will ask you some just be old questions. And, <laughs> you know, maybe I have a couple more minutes to go, so, uh, and then we can get to all of these questions. So. And in fact, um, there's details in the paper about how we built Mordia, and I'm actually going to skip over how we did it, but the key idea is that by these switches uh, are able to support multiple wavelengths of light. And by making a copy of the light by tapping some of the light out of a fiber, we can actually replicate the signals across multiple of these stations. And each of these switches can make orthogonal switching decisions. And this is the key idea that we use to scale up our design. And by adding a variety of these switches into one or more of these ring networks, you're able to support order 600 tours or so with this design. Okay, now we built Mordia uh, over at UCSD using these switches that we got from this startup and we connected them to our servers and we um, measured the switching time of the composed system and it is in fact this two microsecond result. So we're able to keep that fast switching time even though we scaled up to, in this case, 24 ports. The key idea here is that with um, two microsecond switch time, we only need 100 microseconds of stability for something to be circuit friendly. And that means we can actually support the traffic of a single server. And this led to our most recent project, which we just presented last uh, Wednesday at NSDI over across the water there, which is exactly building a top of rack switch that is a hybrid switch that speaks to both circuits and packets at the Tor layer. And um, if we, this is the premise of that project, so it's very simple. If we've got a 10 gigabit packet switch network and we overlay a 100 gigabit circuit switch network into our data center, these effectively can be put together to build a 100 gigabit packet switch for common data center workloads, meaning that if there is sufficient temporal and spatial locality defined by 100 microseconds worth of bursts, then you can deliver a service model akin to this extremely expensive network using two much less expensive and lower cost network technologies. And we built reactor, uh, we using some, uh, this is our, we built an eight port uh, reactor prototype uh, and we hooked it up to our Mordia network. And I just wanna show you one of the graphs from that, that paper and then I'll sort of conclude. So the idea behind reactor is to give the performance akin to a 100 gigabit packet switch but using circuit switching. And so what we did was we deployed eight nodes and we have seven of the nodes sending data to the eighth node. And this is the view from the eighth node. So what it's seeing is that x-axis is time in seconds and the y-axis is throughput. And what you're seeing is uh, each of the um, incoming flows is relatively stable, very nicely fair, very uniform, looking like um, kind of a, a, a very smooth you know, packet switch network. But in reality, if we zoom into this at microsecond timescales, what we see is we're actually rapidly multiplexing small bursts of data from all of these different hosts and delivering them to the end host. And the key idea is that we're able to rapidly multiplex that link fast enough that the transport protocol and the OS doesn't realize that anything's going on. And the analogy here is to process scheduling, where if you can just schedule stuff fast enough, nobody notices that they don't have access to that resource. Okay, so the key idea behind this line of work was been to focus on the predominant sources of cost and power in these networks, which is very surprisingly and sort of counterintuitively cabling costs and transceiver costs. And so we built a variety of uh, projects that have dropped that number down to close to one transceiver per host at 100 gigabits a second. And what's nice is that as we go even beyond 100 gigabits a second, this same approach should be able to apply as well. And um, I just briefly want to mention that what I've described thus far has been taking what are existing building blocks and prototyping them to build new types of networks. But we're also wanting to complete that loop to build new building blocks as well. And so, you know, we started with commercial technology, 
we built some prototype technology, and now um, we're interested in building novel devices designed for data center environments. And so we're doing that inside of a NSF. Uh, there's an engineering research center called Cyan, which is about 12 institutions and about 30 PIs, most of which are photonics and physicists. So they're photonics people and physicists. And the idea is that we're taking all these organizations and actually um, going back to um, uh, a lot of the building blocks we use were designed for the telecom industry. So what we're doing is we're kind of unwinding that decision tree back to the assumptions that were made in building optical devices. And instead of targeting them towards the telecom world, what we're now doing is targeting them towards the data center world, which has a very different set of assumptions. And so there are people in the center that are building new devices. And this is one example that sort of has come together in the last month. And then I'll conclude. So I mentioned in the Mordia design that we have these binary MEMS switches in the network that are making switching decisions. And they're basing those decisions on the wavelength of light that is entering them. Now that's uh, kind of an expensive design, actually, because these switches are very expensive. Now what you can do instead is there's researchers in the center that have been working on silicon photonics tunable lasers, which sounds very sci-fi, but is actually uh, uh, not a very, it's not much more expensive than building regular transceivers today. But the cool thing about this is that by changing the frequency at the source, you actually don't need those switches. You can build an entirely passive uh, interconnect network and simply have the sources change the frequencies that they transmit on. And so through the center, we were able to take that research and send it to a fab and build it onto a chip and then partner with this company in Berkeley to package that in an SOP module that we can then reinsert into the Mordia switch. And so that happened about three weeks ago. And so that's kind of what the future work is for this project, which is to lower the cost of that, of that network. Okay, so in summary, you know, it's important to sort of pivot away from the question of scaling to scaling uh, in a resource efficient way. And I've talked a little bit about IO efficient data processing and data intensive networking. And before I conclude, I want to acknowledge the incredible students that I've had the opportunity to work with that have been driving much of this research. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and open the floor to questions. Yeah. It's great that you got the switching delay so small, yeah. but we've also found that uh, if you're willing to deal with uh, additional traffic hops, that you could uh, kind of get away with the need for a lot of switching while carrying still a lot of traffic. Yeah. Have you used any of that? For yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, yeah, th so um, this is like things like OSA and other projects that rely on kind of overlay or multi-hop. Um, it's another degree of freedom. So all of the designs that I've talked about have been effectively either zero hop or one hop, depending on how you look at it. And the second that you can start forwarding traffic through intermediaries, maybe using things like RDMA or something, um, it gives you this additional degree of freedom where now you have a scheduling decision, which is, do I wait till I get a circuit assigned to me? Or do I sort of send data to some intermediary point, which can then send it on my behalf? Um, and it's it's actually quite interesting because nothing that we've talked about precludes that. It's just that that hasn't been something that we've been focusing on. But, you know. Yeah, we're told. So you that you have a few microseconds. Um, that, does it make sense to reduce it further? So this is, a, this is an interesting point because we were sort of saying what, what's in some sense fundamental here. I think that there's an interesting sweet spot at the kind of O of one microsecond time scale because at, at, at 10 gigabits, a packet's, you know, one point two microseconds or so. Um, and in order to use circuit switching, well, I should say we've, we've moved, to, we, we haven't looked at optical packet switching at all. We've really been focusing on circuit switching because it's something that's practical and that could be deployed. And so what you really need is a burst size. And if you're talking about 10 or 40 or even 100 gigabits a second, one microsecond gives you reasonable burst size that seem to match well with what servers are able to generate. If we were to push that switching speed much lower, we would end up kind of hitting up to the packet boundary and building effectively a packet switch, which isn't really what we want to do. And if we pushed it to be a higher value, we would end up needing so much burstiness that it would be very difficult to get servers to be able to generate that. So it, it happens to be a, a particularly attractive spot at sort of oh, one microsecond or so. So we haven't looked at trying to make switching faster. There are technologies that could do that. There's uh, SOA switches and stuff that operate in nanoseconds. But from our point of view, we lose our circuit switching benefit from adopting those techniques. So why, why, why aren't people building just like 
almost like RF inspired optical switches. Like uh, RF doesn't need any switching. People just kind of at the transceiver side, they just try things. Um, so, do you, so you mean like wireless? Yeah. Well, I would say that, I mean, the work on, say, 60 gigahertz wireless in the data center, in a sense, needs switching because you're, you're either physically moving things or you're somehow choosing a different target to transmit to, I guess. So that's a different thing. I was thinking like an optical switch that instead of, like, I think part of the, part of the thing, it seems to me like the scheduling control plane at data center wide, it has complexity. Yes. And that complexity is coming from the fact that you have this kind of switching schedule, like no matter how fast, it's still complex, right? Yes, that's right. Um, that doesn't show up like, you know, in, in cellular domain or whatnot. Like, you know, my phone can speak at any given time without actually having like a global schedule across all transceivers. Uh, well, so you, so you have channel mitigation, so that's one thing. So imagine this network, so with optics, it's like a wireless network where every terminal is hidden terminal. So think of it that way. It's like, if imagine a wireless network where every node was hidden. Um, the tunable laser idea that I just talked about, one of the things that's interesting is that you end up in a situation where if two end ho or if two, let's say, TORs choose the same uh, frequency to transmit on, that interference will cause data loss. And so what we're going to do to solve that is a very simple um, kind of brute force approach, which is to create a registry service wherein you opportunistically a a acquire a channel, and then you register with the service that you get the channel. And if two devices end up conflicting on that, one of them will win, and the others will stop sending. And we can bound the amount of time given the amount of, like the slot time, the contention time can be small. This is just techniques from the wireless domain. And then we can code over that to make use of, so we don't lose data. So this is very much like a carrier sense right. approach, just in the optical domain. My understanding, and I'm not a physicist or an optics person, really. I'm a computer scientist. But my understanding from talking to the optics people, because I asked a lot about like their CDMA, for example. Could we do O, FDMA, or whatever? And my understanding is that it's, it's not a very promising approach. But that's a little bit out of my domain. Just to be clear, what he's saying, couldn't you choose a different lambda? That's what he's talking about. So oh, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, that's what we do. We, so we pick a different lambda. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so our approach is basically that you give it a list of, in preference order, of the lambdas you want, and then it tells you back you can have three and you can have five or whatever. But, but presumably you have fewer lambdas than n squared. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the number of lambdas that's that you get. That's what the Current technology, yeah, current technology, the number of lambdas is O of 100. Think of it that way. Is that not enough? Uh, not for n squared, but just generally because you're switching. Um, you know, if we want to support, say, 600 tours, let's say, you'd need, you'd need to add a space switching into that as well. And that's what we're going to do. Because we can't plug, we can't really fit more lambdas into a fiber, but you can have multiple fibers effectively. And what you can do is choose which fiber you're going to send data on and then which frequency you're going to send within that fiber. And that's where I was mentioning that point about how we don't need a global scheduling decision because we do need a global scheduler that decides what tours are connected to which other tours. But once those two tours are connected to each other, the specific frequencies that are being used can be negotiated on a pairwise basis, which is a much simpler problem to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Can you comment on the reliability of the same as the hybrid uh, electric optical network? And Ernie Usman should also make a comment about, you know, copper not being good at long distances. Have you essentially yeah. seen some, for example, vibration effects on copper versus optical? Yeah, optical. so this is actually a great point. There's, um, there's two things I could say about that. One is that this stuff is super reliable because it's built by the telecom industry and it's very expensive. So they had these, these goals of like 10 to the minus 18th bit error rates. Um, the reason that this stuff's expensive, and I mentioned before that we're back, winding back that decision tree to build devices that are tailored to data centers, which is that we don't need 10 to the negative 18th bit error rate. It, we have other ways of dealing with um, errors that if they made the network substrate significantly cheaper and more integrated, it might be a good trade-off. Um, and so what I would say is the telecom stuff we're using has been incredibly reliable. Um, and then there was another point that I was going to say about, um, so yeah, the technology we've used has been fine so far. But in terms of handling failures in this model, because of this 100 uh, channels per fiber, if we move to a multi-fiber or multi-ring type network, the way you can think of that is that I'm now spreading traffic over multiple rings. And so if one of these 
rings were to fail in some way, that proportionally reduces my bandwidth by n minus 1. And so there's kind of a nice failure recovery model there as well. So you don't lose. It's not all or nothing. You could imagine degrading our service based on the number of failures that you get. So if a laser fails or something like that, you might lose a fifth of your bandwidth or something like that. But you don't lose 100% of your bandwidth. Have you also seen like buffer with some like Oh. Same uh, I don't have any concrete quantitative data on failure rates between the two of them. But um, what I would say is that <coughs> the optical stuff, especially the stuff for the telecom industry, is really reliable. So um, there are failures that occur, of course, but uh, it hasn't been a big problem for us. Now, one of the things that I will say is that these tunable lasers, the way they actually tune is that they have very small heaters next to the laser that change the temperature. Because the, the, the frequency that they transmit depends on the temperature. Now, the flip side is that in a data center, if you have changes in temperature, you have to have some way to stabilize that, that temperature. And so one of the areas that's really, that a lot of the optics people are working on is on um, devices that don't require active cooling and stabilization of temperature. But yeah, we didn't run into that problem at all. So we have a sort of a data center like the size of this room at UCSD, and it's got some chillers and stuff in it. And we have not experienced any failures in three years. But we're very small scale. So. For example, like any vibration effects of that sort of No, nothing like that. We also, just as a side point, for the sorting record, we had 1,000 spinning disks. We never saw any vibration effects at all in the time we used that. Yeah. You mentioned the skin effect in copper. Yes. At lower frequencies, there is a fix of making a, say, replacing a single cable by a braid of insulated cable. Mm. But does that get too ridiculous as the frequency? My understanding is that it does. And again, y'all are the experts here, but the labor involved in plugging all these cables in is very non-trivial. And it's gotten to the point where organizations like Google are building these robots to build cable assemblies so they can plug one layer of switching into another. And the second you say, I want to take 10 big fat cables and put a 500 of them together into a bundle this big, I think people don't like that. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's thank George. All right, thank you.